In this video, what I hope to do is give you one last run through on the things you need to know about series. For more details, for more uh, slowly worked problems, because I'm going to go pretty quick in this one, you should re refer back to earlier videos or other videos on free response questions. Like I said, this is going to be a very quick overview. Here we go. Converge or diverge. Remember, you have a list of many tests you can use. The root test, the ratio test, limit comparison, direct comparison, integral test. Two of the fastest and most commonly used tests are the ones I want to talk about here. And those are the P-series and the geometric series. These are the two that are probably tested the most. The P-series is... Uh, a series where you have a constant on top, it doesn't matter what that constant is, and on the bottom you've got n to a power. And you will converge as long as what is in that box is bigger than 1. You will diverge if what is in that box is less than or equal to 1. And this test, you know, it's a ton of times used with like square roots and cube roots. Write it as a power. If it's 1 over the square root of n, write it as 1 over n to the 1 half and know that it diverges. But you can also use this for things like 1 over 2n minus 1 or um, you know 3 over n squared plus 4. Things like this where we are we can use limit comparison and say well this is an awful lot like 1 over 2n and since n is to the first this thing must diverge. Whereas this thing 3 over n squared well the power is bigger so this must converge. We can do that a ton with our limit comparison as well. Now on to geometric. Geometric series are ones where we have something being raised to the nth power. And as long as that box is between negative 1 and 1, we converge. Okay, you diverge if it's anything less than that. So again, uh, this is a really frequent one. Just be careful. Is what's in this box bigger or smaller than 1? Um, and again, you converge as long as you're between 1 and negative 1. All right, moving on. A Taylor series. A Taylor series, this is the general form. Um, what you have to remember is that it is always a derivative divided by the corresponding factorial, and then x minus to whatever value you're making the series about to the same power. These things must agree. Second derivative, two factorial, second power. Three factorial, or I'm sorry, third derivative, three factorial, third power. So make sure that those things agree. Uh, when a is zero, when you're making the series about zero, it is sometimes called a Maclaurin series. Sometimes they say a Taylor about zero, but that actually is a Maclaurin. And down here I have the Maclaurin series that you are supposed to have memorized. So you uh, should take the time and brush up on those if you haven't already. e to the x, sine x, cosine x, and one quick note on this bottom series. This is a, uh, the sum of a geometric series. You'll notice that uh, the first term is 1, and we're going by x every time. So the common ratio is x. Remember the sum of a geometric is first term over 1 minus ratio. Alright, moving on. Uh, using the series uh, to build a new, or to build a series, using that formula, um, you know, if, if I give you some values of a function and its derivative, you should be able to find the series. For example, this one made about 2. I tell you that the zeroth derivative or function is 3, so divide by 0 factorial, x minus 2 to the 0. Uh, then we've got uh, negative 1. First derivative goes over 1 factorial, and then it's x minus 2 to the first. Then we've got the second derivative over 2 factorial, x minus 2 to the second. Then we've got the third derivative over 3 factorial, x minus 2 cubed. And we could certainly clean all that up, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to simplify it. And of course, if this were on the AP exam and the free response, you shouldn't simplify it either. Uh, working the other way, what if you were given a third degree Taylor series? By the way, do not be thrown by this notation. This simply means it's a Taylor series. The sub notation typically means it's a third, uh, third degree. Sometimes you see this as a P instead, meaning it's a Taylor polynomial. So, I know that the original function at apparently 1, apparently this thing was made about 1 since it's x minus a, x minus, like that, um, 
at 1, when I divided by one or 0 factorial, I apparently got 5. So I would just say f of 1 must be 5. That must be the function's value. When I found this first derivative and divided it by 1 factorial, I must have gotten 2, since this is the coefficient that went on x to the first. So to, multiplying both sides by 1 factorial, I know that f prime of 1 must be 2. Now it gets more interesting. When I say that f double prime of 1, when divided by 2 factorial, must be 3, because that's the coefficient that goes on the squared term, multiply both sides by 2 factorial, I know that f double prime must be 6. And finally, the third derivative, f1, when divided by 3 factorial, be careful here of your signs, this is negative 8, so when you multiply both sides by 3 factorial, which is 6, we find out that the third derivative is negative 48. So you should be able to be given derivatives and write the series, and you should be able to, given the series, write the derivatives. Um, the one other thing that you may have to do is actually find these values by hand, meaning you are given a function, you know, you're given some function, and you have to write down the derivative and evaluate it. And if you just remember, we would write those, and we put the line, we'd say, okay, when x is 2, and we plug 2 in, and we would create our own table of values. You may have to do that as well. Moving on. All right, the interval and radius of convergence. Remember, to find the interval of convergence, we always do ratio tests. Okay, so we've got x minus 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, divided by the nth term or multiplied by the reciprocal. And remember, ratio test says we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity, and we need for this to be less than 1. Now, th there's a lot of algebra you may have to do here, and I don't have time to show you every trick and everything. Um, probably the most common thing I, I would just point out, partner stuff up, you know, say, okay, I've got an x minus 2 left over that gets pulled out front, right? And then the stuff that's just n, just plain old n's, uh, let the limit deal with that, okay? n over n plus 1. We're going to be less than 1. This limit is 1. Evaluate the limit. So x minus 2 when multiplied by 1 must be less than 1. Now, we now start accounting for the alternating series. Okay, so we say, well, it actually could be between 1 or negative 1. Sometimes you'll just see that denoted with an absolute value up here. But just remember, we need to solve both sides. Add 2 to both sides. We've got 1 and we've got 3. Now, before we are done, we need to check the endpoints. By endpoints, what I mean is you start by saying, okay, what if x were 1? Go back to the original series and say, okay, I'm plugging in x is 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So the series becomes negative 1 to the n over n. This series that I've just written, this converges conditionally, but that's enough. So we put an equal sign under the... Uh, facing 1 because apparently 1 makes it converge. Again, remember with an alternating series, as long as the individual terms are going towards 0, getting closer and closer to 0, we are converging conditionally. If the series would have converged even without the alternating piece, then we say it converges absolutely. All right, let's check the other endpoint. X is 3. Well, 3 minus 2 up here, 3 minus 2 is 1. And 1 to the n is just 1. So this just becomes 1 over n. And this is a divergent P series. It's the harmonic series. So this is our interval of convergence. Now, the interval is 2 units wide, which means the radius is 1. The radius is half the length of the interval. And you wouldn't have needed to check the endpoints to get the radius of convergence. Being, you know, being equal to 1 or 3 or whatever doesn't matter. Okay, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't need to check if you were just asked to do the radius. Moving on. All right, making a known series, uh, making a new series out of a known series. Now, I've tried to throw as much in this as I possibly could. You'll see 
the e to the 6x, and that's where I'm going to start. Okay, so we are going to make the Taylor series, or excuse me, the Maclaurin series for f of x. Okay, so I'm just going to write, we're going to make the Maclaurin for f of x. Okay, so I'm going to begin by saying, all right, e to the x is approximated by 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial. Dot, dot, dot. So e to the 6x, every time I see an x, I'm going to, um, I'm going to replace it with a 6x. So 6x squared, I got 36x squared over 2 factorial. And here I've got uh, 6 cubed is 216x cubed over 3 factorial. You should always do any kind of substituting first. Okay, 6x was put in place of x, so we do that first. Next, I'm going to do the, the multiplier. Okay, so that means every term got multiplied by an x because what we've done is we've taken e to the 6x and we've really replaced it with this. So we're now we're going to multiply by x. We're going to say x times that is the same as x times all of this. So I've got x plus 6x squared plus 36x cubed over 2 factorial plus 216x to the fourth over 3 factorial. Okay, so what I have now in blue, this right here, this could replace this. Okay, now at the end of that, I have I have now uh, subtracted 6x squared and subtracted an x. So think about that. We take let me maybe put this in red. We're going to do that. We're going to now subtract a 6x squared and subtract an x. So the x's are 0, 6x squareds are 0. And then I am dividing the entire thing by x. Okay, so I'm dividing the whole thing by x. So doing that down here, taking the whole thing, putting it over x, is the same as dividing each piece by x. So 36x cubed divided by 2 factorial divided by x is 36x squared over 2 factorial plus 216x cubed over 3 factorial. And now I have a new series. And with this then I could integrate it. I could, um, I could find the derivative of each term. I could um, find the limits. I could find second derivatives. I could do a lot of things. And the thing to remember about this is it's called a p-series because all we should need to do is power rule. Okay. So the first thing you should do is substituting, then multiply, and then at the end, once you have your kind of uh, you know your new series for that, then you can start subtracting off terms or adding terms. You know, if I would have put like a plus one here. At the end, then I would have just put a plus 1 right here, something like that. The important thing is to remember the 6x squared and minus x are not being subtracted from every term. It's being subtracted from the entire thing. If we wanted it subtracted from every term, we would have had to somehow put it in the exponent as part of our substitution. Okay, moving on. Last but not least, error bound. Error bound, uh, there are two things you need to know, and it really all hinges on whatever the next term is. If a series is alternating, you just find the next term and plug in the values. So, for example, if it said, hey, we used a fifth degree uh, series to estimate x equals 5, what's the error bound? Well, you'd find the sixth degree series and plug in the same value of x, and that will give you your error. Okay. Lagrange error bound is a little bit different in that instead of, you know, we always have a series as the nth derivative over n factorial x minus a to the nth. This is adjusted a little bit for Lagrange in that it is the maximum of the nth derivative on the interval from, you know, where we were making the series to where we were using the series. But this is given to you, okay? This is typically, and you've seen enough problems where maybe a graph has been given. They say, hey, here's the graph of the fifth derivative. Or they say the fifth der derivative is always less than or equal to 3. Or here's the fifth derivative. Graph it and tell us what the maximum is. And then you find that, divide by the factorial that goes with it, and do x minus whatever you've made the series about to the same power. Um, 
error bound really is not that difficult. If you want to see more examples, look back at earlier videos. Um, don't panic about it. Just remember, it's always based on the next term. So again, if, if you use the fourth degree polynomial, that means the fifth degree is what you need to do. So you'd need to do the fifth derivative and the five factorial, x minus the number to the fifth. If you use the eighth degree, then you do the ninth derivative, nine factorial, x minus eight to the ninth power. As long as you remember that, you should be able to piece together error bound. And that's it. This was a quick throw to, uh, rundown of all of the stuff about series that you need to know.